Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Rivals Race Chat. Adam and Clinton here, as we are every Tuesday night. But we're not live. We're pre-recorded, so you guys feel free to talk amongst yourselves. And, uh, you know, we, we barely pay attention to the comments anyways. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say In that. In fairness, this week's show, we're going to pay more attention to the comments than ever. Well, because we'll be here. We're here, Clint. Like, yes. Like, this show is happening right like it's happening right now but we are also here when right now happens to participate in the chat at the regular right now time right so uh we'll, we'll be around regular right now time we actually we're probably you're right we'll participate more tonight than we ever would so uh thank you we have some great guests uh a, a few people we've been meaning to get to for the last few weeks obviously derek lynch uh recently in the Canadian motorsport hall of fame uh inducted on the previous weekend so we'll bring him on to talk about he and he I think Derek really, um, for this generation that missed Derek's career, I think in the first stages can look at the big post he made a couple years ago about, about racing. And I'm not sure if we have it, but it was many good points about what everybody has to kind of look at what we need to do to fix the sport. And I thought it was brilliant. And uh, Derek, it's always a great mind. Great to have him coming up here shortly. Tim Terry from the East Coast, Adam, as you know, uh, we both know Tim. Uh, pretty much the hub of everything racing in the Maritime. So good to have Tim on to talk about that. He's participating in a lot of our G4 stuff via chat, so it'll be good to have him on. And then Matt Williamson recently picked up the Gator, and Volusia's going to join us as well near the end of the program to discuss uh, dirt racing in Florida and what's ahead for him in 2023. How you doing? I'm all right, man. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Look. Derek Lynch should turn that post that he made all of that commentary should be turned into maybe not a book, but a souvenir program at the very least. Yeah, uh, good idea. It could, it could be a pretty cool document, I would think. Well, he's standing by. Let's bring him on. Derek, welcome to Rivals Race Chat. Uh, I'll be the first one to say, man, you don't look old enough to be in that Motorsport Hall of Fame. So uh, you're looking good these days. Thank you very much, and it's great to be on, Adam. Good to see you guys both, and uh, like I say, thanks for having me on here. No, thanks for coming on, Derek. And, and one thing we left out in talking about you in the introduction, Derek Lynch is not just a, a driver with a storied racing career, but has been on the other side of the fence as well as a, as a race promoter, uh, married to a great racing mind, so you're also married into a fantastic racing family. So you come at it from a lot of angles, Derek. So what was it like? Congratulations on being inducted. What was it like to look back on your whole life and sum it up into into <laughs> one speech, into a microphone on the weekend? It was uh, it was humbling to say the least. Um, like when I got the call from. From Peter Lockhart, um, it was it was quite a surprise, um, but yeah, humbling would be the best word, Adam, because like you said, I mean, I, I raced and then we did the Kawartha deal. Um, I, I raced again, raced during the Kawartha deal. Uh, I was down south on a on a, a couple of you know fairly storied Cup teams and truck teams. Um, so yeah, it's been a a great body of work and it's it's been a lot of fun and and I've I've met a lot of great people along the way. But I also, as you indicated, got a great cross section of the sport um, from from every angle. And and then when we did the work at Kawartha for those nine seasons we were there, uh, certainly Kate's involvement was invaluable because her family grew up on that side of the fence. And you know anybody who generationally or not hasn't heard of Tom Curley should look him up. And so <laughs> being able to race under that mentorship, being able to be married to someone who worked under that mentorship and then combine all that. It, it, yeah. It, it's been a, a great career and, and a lot of fun and, and yeah, lots of people to draw from that, that, uh, you know, have kind of made it all at what it is. Well, as you said, your father-in-law is well-renowned as a promoter and everything, but uh, did he, did he encourage you or did he like, man, get out of that business? What are you doing? Was he encouraging or uh, trying to t tell you to shy away from it? He, no, he was encouraging. Um, you know, he certainly was very upfront about it. And, and when we started at Quartha, he came up for the first couple of weeks and kind of helped us get us appointed. And I remember taking a lot of uh, our kind of core officials that we had at the time down to Thunder Road for a couple of races there to kind of show them how a clockwork speedway should run. I mean, this is how people, it should happen. We shouldn't have a, a program that starts at seven and ends at one thirty in the morning. I mean, it should end around 10 o'clock at night and, uh, and how they went about that. So no, he was very supportive. Um, 
you know, and I, I will say, Tom, Tom liked to be right. So if there was something that you did that, you know, maybe he hadn't thought of yet, he might have been slow to get on board because he liked to be the leader that way. But no, he was certainly supportive and, and we couldn't have done it without his input. And I mean, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but I, I said when we started at Kawartha, um, we started with stuff that he was using in 1985. And we started there in 2003. So we had lots of material to work with, things that he had done, programs he had ran, things he had tried. So it was a huge advantage for us, yeah. Derek, there, there's not that many original ideas in racing. You can, you can take what's happened historically and move it to a different province. So take what's done in, in Vermont and move it to Ontario. Wow, this is new and fresh. It's still been done before. But even having the sense to see something that works really well and knowing the difference between what it is that makes it work and not, there, there's a lot of magic behind the scenes that, that would, with your kind of common sense, doesn't look all that magical, but you know, you do the, you follow the steps of a good program. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And, and you can make it run pretty well. And you did. I want to talk about way back in the beginning, because would you say, uh, were a lot of people from Ontario going to run NASCAR North or looking to that as a, uh, as a stepping stone? No, not at all. To be quite frank, the only other person that I knew that really ran uh, NASCAR North um, would have been Dean Ferry um, out of the Niagara St. Catharines area. You know, Dean made a foray there sometime in the middle to uh, to late. Uh, I guess that would be early nineties. Um, but uh, no, I mean we we got done with the ACT program um, and we had had some success in that ninety three ninety four seasons with ACT. And at that point, we had the opportunity. Uh, O'Connor raised Mike M. O'Connor called me and uh, offered me the ride there um, and it, it seemed like the next progression because the the second and third tiers of NASCAR were really taken off and beginning to have uh, you know quite a bit of uh, you know success as far as going to the next level so that that's kind of why we ended up at, at that point. Derek what are you doing these days we saw you restoring a car not too long ago uh, what are you up to? Yeah so I found uh, the last chassis that my dad raced uh, built new by uh, Hanley in 79, 78. Uh, so I've been working away and restoring it. And so dad, dad ran it from 78 to 83. Uh, at that point, he sold it to Brian Cathcart. Everybody uh, in Ontario knows Brian. He's such a great supporter of, uh, of all motorsports. Uh, Brian raced it up until the 89 season, I believe it was. Uh, and then John Bickle uh, ran it. Uh, John was a Oscar competitor. And then it kind of sat dormant, I think, in, uh, about around 2000 was the last it did anything. And John parked it up on top of the combine out behind his barn. And uh, it was, I think, Dan McCaddy that told me that the car was sitting down there. And I went down and looked at it. Um, and it was definitely it, I could tell. Because as I've kind of indicated on my Facebook posts, when you're 9, 10, 11, that stuff is fairly impressionable. So the minute I saw certain things about the car, I'm like, yeah, no, that, that's what I remember. Um, so, yeah, so I brought it home and it's uh, I found it very intriguing because uh, it, as we were talking about and Adam kind of mentioned how things somewhat stay the same from locale to locale, but you move them around and can kind of breathe some fresh life into them. That period of, of late model racing from like 77 to about 83, you know, that was five or six years. Everything was was just exploding and the changes were happening like almost on a monthly basis. So, so much happened there. And then once we got to about 1985, you can really look at most components on a pavement late model and, and they really look the same as they did almost 40 years ago. Whereas five years prior that, you know, advancement was really happening and we were going away from Camaro clips to tubular clips and all the parts and pieces were evolving. So it's been fun to try and, and, and track that stuff down because I wanted to make it uh, completely original. I didn't want to just find a, a modern day late model chassis and, and put an old style Camaro body on it. I want it to be the same as it was in 1980 or 81. So it's been awesome. I mean, it's been a great project and uh, I've had lots of help from a lot of people. And it's funny because the stuff is so hard to find. And when you do track it down, guys are a little bit reluctant to part with it. And then you tell them what you're doing with it. And they're like, Oh, that's awesome. Here you go. You can have it, you know, so uh, we've had a lot of great support from a lot of people. So it's been fun. You, you've got to be able to tell a good story, Derek. And if, if there's one thing that you can do that, uh, that, that would be it. I could, I could see you spinning that web pretty well. Thank you very much. But like I said, everybody's been, uh, 
been great. And I'm lucky that uh, that Chaz Howe at Howe Racing Enterprises, where, you know, when Junior first started building a lot of his cars, you know, were identical to what the Howe stuff was at the time. So um, Chaz has all the drawings and, and all those part numbers and, you know, stuff that, yeah, I mean, it's not like a Chevy Impala from 1980. There was, you know, how many millions of those produced? These stock car chassis, there was only a few hundred produced, and most of them either got destroyed or cut up or altered along the way. So it's been great to have that person to to say, no, this is what it would have been. This is what the original part number was. If you can find it, good luck, but this is what you're looking for. So he's been a great help as well. And a lot of the older racers have, uh, you know, they chime on the Facebook post. They've forgotten about it, but then when they see it, they're like, oh, I remember that. And it, it came from this or it was on that. So like I said, it's been a, been a group effort, but it's been a lot of fun and it's coming together. So hoping to get it to Motorama for the show in 24. That's my goal. So we got another year to go. So hopefully we should be there. What uh, what racing events do you get to anymore, Derek? I, do you get to a lot throughout a summer? So last year we we bought a portable toilet business five years ago, and uh, and that's been great. It's been a great business, and and we're having a lot of fun. Um, but as a result, trying to get that up and going, and it and it's been growing, um, and just the day to day maintenance. So I only made it to Peterborough once last year. Uh, we raced. We had a good night. Um, I was going for the lead on the white flag lap, and. Uh, well, let's just say that there was contact and I ended up at the back anyways, but uh, they, they knew we were there, whether that was good or bad. So we had a good night. The car was working good, but just with work restrictions, uh, it's been tough to get out. But we've got some great people now. Uh, we've kind of got it. So we've got a couple employees to take the load off. So hoping to definitely get to Peterborough some this year. And uh, and I'd really like to run a couple of APC races. They're going to be back at Peterborough again. And I've always enjoyed Delaware. So I'd like to get down to Delaware and if I can run, you know, a couple or three APC races, that'd be awesome. So, Derek, uh, I got a couple questions for you about what's wrong in Ontario racing, and maybe you can give us a few points to fix it up from one promoter to another. But before I get into that, uh, you mentioned Kawartha Speedway. There's a lot of questions about Kawartha. Is it going to come back? What do you know about the situation? Obviously, you you had your hands in there for a while. So, do you know anything about what's going on at Kawartha? And I don't mean to put you on the spot. We've not discussed it at all, but just figured I'd throw it out. What yeah. do you know? Is there any hope? You have a great track. It was a beautiful racetrack, beautiful racetrack. Um, you know, Skip did an awesome job. Um, if I'm being honest, I, I think it's done. Um, they, they took all the catch fence down last year. Um, I was lucky enough that the guys that were there that knew me, I got the two stoplights out of either corner. Uh, they promised me a piece of the front stretch when it comes up, so a little morbid, but it's still cool to have. Um, but no, Clinton, I, I think it's done. I hate to admit that, but I, I think it's done. I know they ran a couple of – you know, ancillary events there last year. They had a couple demo derbies. I think they had a truck pull. I think they had a tractor pull. Uh, I don't think any of the pavement itself has been been tore up, um, but they're slowly taking it down from the outside in is what my understanding is. And they've just been on the radio and TV here recently in the last couple of weeks talking about upcoming events. And there's certainly no mention or discussion at all of, of car racing. They're, they're focused back on the horses and I think they want to do some concerts and some other things. So I think their ultimate goal is to take all that pavement, uh, especially the racetrack and the infield, turn that into more of a grass area that they can hold outdoor concerts and things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's still there, but they're they're kind of taking it apart piece by piece. Like if you went back in tomorrow to run a race, you, you'd have to make a significant investment in order to get back to, you know, be able to host an event. So I, I think we're I think we're done, unfortunately. Adam? Please. No, you said you had a couple of questions. Oh, yeah, so, so thought, all right, we'll jump in that. So, Derek, you know, you've got a lot of philosophies on what's wrong. Like, Give us maybe two or three things that we need to fix here in Ontario racing. Could be anything. From the Porter John. I, I don't I don't think there's a lot that needs to be fixing. Um, I said the other day that I think that as far as um, prosperity of the racetracks and the divisions – it seems to be coming back and it seems to be in a good position. Like even last year at Peterborough, um, there were several nights where they had good car counts, 16, 17 cars. Uh, it seems like Delaware, Flamborough, uh, you know, all those places, Sunset that are still running late mall divisions are, are doing a good job and having good car counts. Um, the only thing that I ever continue to question is I just think the programs run too long. I think we spend way too much time, cars going around under caution. And I say this about, about pavement racing because I, I don't follow dirt racing enough to lump that in there. Uh, but in the pavement racing, we just waste too much time lining up cars, um, circling around under yellow flags with no activities going on. Um, 
it just doesn't need to be that way. That's the biggest demise. I just think people lose interest. I mean, our interest level in general and our attention span is way down compared to what it was 15 years ago. Uh, and they just they just waste too much time with that. But but as far as, you know, the actual technicality of it, um, they've got to get to one late model class. I don't know why we've continued to drag our feet on that. Like if, if APC, you know, late model series is the premier series in Ontario, make it so that every weekly racetrack is APC legal. Um, and that way, when APC comes to town, every car that's there is eligible to run. Maybe only two or three will, but at least they can run. Um, and that's the thing that dirt racing has always had over pavement racing for years now. We can take a dirt modified sprint car, late model. We can race it at, at Humberstone, Merrittville, Brighton, and we can go and race it in West Virginia or Kentucky or Florida. And, and that's always hurt pavement racing is just too many different rule packages. So tighten the shows up make the rules the same in all the divisions. Those are the two things they've got to fix. And I, I just don't know why it takes so long to get that done. I, everybody's afraid of losing what they have as opposed to moving forward and just saying, this is what it is. Come join us. So if we could do that, I, I think perfect. I think there's just two, two small things in my mind, but it just, it, we seem to take a long time getting there. Yeah. Derek, if I can ask you I one other question. Moving. I just want to know, Adam, um, what's your thoughts on the NASCAR Pinty series these days, Derek? Whoa. You know, I'm, I've, I've made kind of a, 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 a career of being honest. Um, I, I'm shocked it still goes. I, I really am. I mean, I, I've said that when, it, when NASCAR took it over in 2007, any division I had seen that was prospering from Northwest Tour, Southwest Tour, all pro, art go, whenever NASCAR took them over, they failed. They just, they, they ruled the competitors rate out of existence. Um, the cost skyrocketed. Um, uh, when, when NASCAR took over from Cascar in 07, I thought this has got three or four years. So, um, again, uh, I'm surprised and I'll eat crow on that because it's still going. And it seems like last year and what I'm seeing this year coming up, it's gaining more, um, momentum. And, and, you know, I, I wish there weren't so many, what I call rent a rides, you know, um, I wish there was more guys that were there with their own stuff. But guys like Scott and DJ and, and, and um, Ed and Jason there with Hackinson, I mean, they're providing good cars. Uh, Whitey's providing good cars for, for good guys. Um, and it's, it's going good. I mean, so I'm happy for them because I know they've got a significant investment in that. Um, I think the racing is great. You know, I, I don't ever want to say that the racing is, isn't good because it is. I just think the cost is such a factor. I just I, I tip my hat to these guys that can continue to fund fund these efforts because travel and cost except the product hits the racetrack it's it's good racing you know about that and I see it going for everybody that's invested in it. Yeah. Yeah. I just I just have one more question for you, Derek. I I'd like to if you would take two of the things on, on your massive list that, that you posted. Like I said, I I loved each and every one of them. What are two things that still ring true to you that, that you think have some, some impact to them? Um, I think it's the rules, Adam. I really wish in pavement racing we could get those rules uniform so that everybody – people are want to be local racers, but I think once in a while they like the opportunity to go and test the water somewhere else. And I don't think that means they're not coming back. I think they just want to go and try something else. And if the rules were the same, I think everybody would benefit from that. And a mini stock, a super stock, a late model, make them the same. Somebody's going to run Peterborough every Saturday night, but you know what? They might want to go to Delaware on a Friday night and try it. And I think that's good for everybody. Um, and the other thing, it would be to just, like I said earlier, get the shows tighter. Um, you know, I, I just think that people want to see a, a, a tight program. I don't think, I mean, Ash Weekend does a great job. I mean, cars coming out on the racetrack as soon as the other class is going off or the last heat race is going off, that's how it should be. You know, and I, these these tracks that just can't tighten the schedule up of the night, I, I think is a, a downfall. Um, you know, and the third thing I would add, and I don't know how we fix this, I know you only asked for two, is somehow cure um, the negativity surrounding racetracks on social media. And I know that's an impossible task because it's about everything. But I just, I feel badly if people had any idea what it costs, and you guys both know this because you're behind the scenes, if they knew the investment that Glenn Styers is making every Saturday night at this weekend to put that show on, 
and John and, and, and are making at Flamborough and, and the guys at Delaware are making, I mean, it, it's not an easy task. And, and the minute there's one little hiccup, everybody's there so quick to criticize them and carve them down. It's just not good for business, unfortunately. So I, I just wish we could realize we're all in it together and we all have to keep it lifted up and, and present it in a good, good light, you know. So those would be my three things. Uh, we appreciate your time and congratulations on your induction once again, Derek. It's been great to have you on the program tonight. We look forward to talking to you again. Awesome, guys. Thank you very much. Congrats to the great work that you do. Uh, again, you guys are always keeping what you, what's going on at the forefront. And I've always said that when the downtimes come, you guys keep things up so everybody can still realize there's something going on. So thanks for having me. Happy to come on anytime and all the best. Appreciate it. Thanks, Derek. No, I, he, he brought up a good point, Adam. You know, how do you stop the negativity in social media? I mean, from the Osh Weekend side, I, I, I tend to hit it head on. Uh, if someone's out there throwing us under the bus under social media and it's one of our own guys, they're going to get a message from me. I'm like, you know where to call me. Why, why do you got to be like that? You know, let, let's yeah. work on this together. And I think we've done a good job. And, you know, from the Osh Weekend side, I, I think my first – my first uh, speech at the banquet, I just got hired a week earlier, and I kind of said, you know, yeah, stick with us and don't burn us down because at that time the Niagara tracks were just getting slaughtered on Facebook, and I knew if we didn't change it right away, we could, we could fall to it. But thankfully everybody pulls on that rope together, and uh, we, we had some great meetings yesterday at Osh Weekend too. So I know Tim Terry's waiting on. Uh, we're going to follow up the Osh Weekend stuff, but let's get Tim on. Uh, he's flown in all the way from the East Coast here of Canada. I, I think he's down south. I think he's down south. Oh, right really? Now. Yeah. North Carolina getting ready to fly home tomorrow. Oh, sure. So we talk about you being an East Coast guy, pump it up, and then you're a Southerner now. Way to go. One one week of vacation after Speed Weeks is what, I, what the doctor ordered. So doing that and then coming back and getting all the, the, the work done, I guess, for the, uh, the, the local season, right? You go to Tony Stevens' place for a vacation? So I've spent a lot of time out of this place. It just so happens that this is where I am tonight. <laughs> I haven't seen Tony in years. It's been a long. And Clint, I think I think you know Tony Stevens' plan. I worked with him at Race One Hundred and One years ago, but but as things evolve, Tony does a great job with with streaming races and, and production, and of course hired and collaborated with Tim Terry. But it's funny how. People in different pockets in North America. Uh, it's funny the way we're all connected one way or another. So, no, you're right in the heart of things down there, Tim. So, what have you done as a race fan, as someone on vacation near the center of, of stock car racing in the United States? What have you done on your vacation? I did a lot of race fan stuff. We did the race shops, uh, went out to Charlotte Motor Speedway for a day, got to visit USLCI and, and, and do that after what we did with Winter Nationals and everything else. Got to see their whole setup and uh, just kicked back and relaxed a little bit because it is warmer here than it is at home. I think we had an 80 degree day last week. Uh, so that was really, really nice compared to me flying home to snow. And I think there's 15 to 20 on the way on Thursday. So uh, when I wasn't working on the stuff, getting ready for stuff at home, it was nice to actually soak up some warmth and some sun before we hit home. Oh, it's coming, bud. My dad used to live in uh, just out of Bridgewater there in Nova Scotia, and he got a road two days later, and we were absolutely getting pounded. It took Adam twice long to get home today, and uh, the snows accumulate. Tim, let's talk about the scene in the East Coast. You know, um, we call it the Maritimes. You know that, that So you got a bunch of provinces under a bit of a blanket and a bit of a circuit, if we can call it that. You know, how is it now? Is it healthy? Is it strong? Is it on the, you know, one thing we like to talk about is racing, if you're with it for long enough, it kind of goes in waves. You know, so, some divisions are up one year and down the next in the valley. Where are you guys on that wave right now in the East Coast? I think sustainable is probably the w right word, Clinton, when you look at it, because we, we kind of compared it to before the pandemic and after the pandemic. Uh, I'll use Scotia Speed World as an example. Our, our sportsman car count, which is our biggest late model car count, is up. 
Uh, it's, it's continuing to grow. We've got a couple of rookies coming into the division this year. Uh, the Maritime Pro Stock Tour has kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit. Uh, there's a brand new, what they're calling the Super Late Model Series, which is essentially a Pro Stock or a Pro Late Model rule book. Uh, trying to bring together those two racetracks in New Brunswick and a couple of races in PEI. It hasn't hit the racetrack yet. We'll see what happens with that. But I think everything is pretty sustainable from your Bandolero and your Mini Stock all the way up uh, to your sportsman, your legend, your pro stock. Uh, everybody seems to have a really good card of racing, and it doesn't matter what province you're in, whether you're in New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, even if you're over in Newfoundland. Uh, they've got a great program over there, as you guys have saw with Eastbound. Yeah, Eastbound was a pretty cool facility. Thought it had a great vibe there. And for me, it's hard to wrap my head around you consider all of that one territory. That's like <laughs> us saying that, you know, Ashwikan and Jukas is in the same territory as Winnipeg, Manitoba. It's really not, but it's nice that you guys think that they all lump together. I, I might make a real fool of myself here, but we had someone come on last week in, in the chat and ask, ask about how Cole Butcher's doing. D did I miss something with Cole Butcher? Uh, it's kind of, blown under the radar a little bit but uh, as far as i know and i haven't talked to cole in, in a, a couple of weeks he's relocated down here to mooresville or in the area uh to run the asa national series this year with donnie wilson uh so he's not focused on the plan at home his brother jared is going to be running the full maritime pro stock tour schedule but as far as i know uh his plan is to base out of here and run the ASA series and, and a couple of other big races and uh, kind of branch away from being at home. Interesting. What's yeah, the very, story? Sorry, Adam. Not Go ahead. I was just going to say that's very cool. Very cool. To, because it's, it's odd. We, we have all this Canadian talent, Tim, and, and, Love the fact that there's huge events, the IWK at, at Riverside, and there's there's different events all across the country. But there's been more, I think, like there's been a couple stars coming down from the Maritimes to go and do battle with the big stars in the short track scene, maybe even more so than there has been from Ontario over the last five or ten years. So what what is that link? What's the correlation between a Cole Butcher and... And, and a Donnie Wilson, like how, how are these networks happening? It's one of those things that I, I think Cole wanted to go racing and advance his racing program and do some stuff down here. Uh, they met up and, and obviously the rest is history. They've, they've won a lot of, or, or they've ran in front of a lot of big races. The Oxford 250 win at home was kind of his doing and, and his team uh, from, from the, uh, the Dartmouth area and the Porter's Lake area. Uh, but we, we're seeing a lot of that start with the Legends and Bandolero program. Obviously, we just came off Winter Nationals a couple of weeks ago at Citrus County Speedway, and you see a lot of those teams come down and, and race the Legend car and the Bandolero program, and then almost it kind of ends right there for the late model guys because then you go that next step. Austin McDonald is a prime example, though, obviously with, with uh, Roley and Duff and, and King, Com or King Racing behind them. Uh, they're able to come down and, and do well. And obviously Austin won a cars pro late model race last year. And as far as I know, they're getting ready to, to get at it again on that series. So, uh, there's a lot of that legend and bandolero connection down here. We had, uh, 15 teams from Canada down, uh, racing at Citrus County Speedway. Uh, Kevin Foise did a great job in the master's division. The Canadian legend cars program was well represented as well. Uh, but when you look at that whole, that whole deal, uh, there's some of the late model guys that go and, and do that next step, but uh, Cole Butcher has definitely been the, the star of that as well as uh, Austin McDonald, Nicholas Noggle, same way too. What's going to be the hot story this summer down in your neck of the woods? What's what? Obviously, the I, IWK is the big race, but other than that, what are you looking forward to, Tim? What, or maybe what's a hot story? What's a big headline? Race-wise, obviously, the IWK 250 is always big. Uh, the Mike Stevens Memorial coming up in September, the third week of September at Petty Raceway, is now a $20,000-to-win race, uh, 254 laps. Uh, that race has really gained momentum. It's it's the event now in the province of New Brunswick. Yes, you have the Pro Stock 250. It's B-Way 660. But that race, what Wayne has been able to do with that, along with Jason Carnahan and Robbie Stevens, is absolutely huge. So that's one that a lot have circled around here. Uh, the Super Late Model Series, interested to see how that works. It's, it's not a turf war, but these guys are competing for the same uh, racetracks, the same 
drivers the same attention for these race fans as the Maritime Pro Stock Tour has on that same ground for the last 23 years. So uh, that's going to be one to watch. Uh, the sportsman car count at Scotia Speed World mentioned earlier, that is huge on a weekly division. New Brunswick struggling to get cars in that class. Scotia is hitting 20 a week. Uh, the four-cylinder division ha has been good. It doesn't matter what you look at. There's always some great racing to cover when it comes to this Atlantic Canada side of things. So uh, there's a lot of programs that are very healthy down here. Bud Speedway just reopened in Sydney. Uh, there, there's there's lots you can look at. Well, and that's why we talk to you, Tim, because we, we can just look east and ask Tim and know exactly where we need to be and when. What what happened with – there were some, some – talk about the Pinty series going back to Riverside and then all of a sudden it quieted right down. What, what are you hearing on that front? I, that's the same thing you guys are probably hearing. Uh, I, I heard the rumor back just before Christmas and I uh, had heard the rumblings in behind, but uh, schedule came out and there was no, uh, no TBA, no Riverside, no anything where it may or may not have been. Uh, but we uh, we were kind of excited when we heard the rumor that that hey we we may see the NASCAR Pinty Series back. But uh, I haven't heard anything other than the rumors. Uh, excited to have Eastbound back on the schedule. Uh, for for my sake, it conflicts with the Maritime Pro Stock Tour race, so I can't get over there uh, that weekend. But would love to see the Pinty Series back. It's been a couple of years, and uh, I think the uh, the racing community out here deserves another NASCAR show. Tim, you know, uh, a story came across my desk probably two, two and a half years ago about Miramichi Speedway in New Brunswick. you know anything about that place? It was up for sale, and I was, was having this daydream, Madden, that you and I were going to sell our houses. We could buy the place for about buck ninety nine. I think they were selling it. And we could just run the shit out of it, you know? What do you think, Tim? What, what do you know about Miramichi? So everything's for sale for the right price. I, I talked to Barry about two weeks ago. Uh, when that place was for sale, it was one of those things where uh, Barry was kind of on a little bit of tough time but wanted to keep the racetrack. That area is a, is a big demolition town. Uh, they make their money off of demolitions, but they do have some stock car shows. Uh, their big race at the end of the year is a street stock 100. They have the Atlantic Modified Tour uh, and a bunch of other divisions that come in there. Uh, they knocked it out of the park in 2020. When COVID hit, the only province that was really operating for race cars was the province of New Brunswick because their restrictions were a little more lax. So you had, I think one of their demolitions had 72 cars or 73 cars. Uh, so it kind of came off the market. Uh, Barry's, Barry tells me that, you know, he gets calls ever so often because that story still populates on Google. So he'll get a call as the Speedway for sale. And uh, his answer to everybody is, is everything's for sale for the right price. So uh, if, if anybody's got the pockets and, and wants to keep it a racetrack, that would be great. But he's also expanding the property as well. There's now a motocross track on the property in behind the, the stock car pit. So uh, that's a great area. Uh, Northern New Brunswick, great little town. They love their race cars. They love their demolition. Uh, it's a little ways out of the way from your Moncton or your Fredericton, but uh, still a great place to go to spend a weekend. How am I dreamt about buying the place? I looked at it many late nights. I did a lot of Google research. I, I was yeah. thinking about, you know, what ultimately turned me away from it. I mean, it was just a pipe dream, but we'll put that dream into a nightmare was it was all French. And I mean, I, the only way I'm going to make that work is to be able to talk my way through the town and with businesses and if that language barrier just kind of put the nail on the coffin for the dream. So it's, it's they, not they as do French say. as you think, though. There, there's a lot of English up there. I went up there back in 18, 17 or 18, and they had me do their sportsman race. And their local guy came in and, and said the English stuff, and then he went in, in a string of French. And I, I kind of looked at the promoter, and I said, do I have to do that? And the answer <laughs> was no. So we, we got through it, and I – a lot of their stuff up there, they do have some French folks. Uh, a lot of it is English, though, and a lot of the French folks kind of know how to feel their way around the English stuff. So uh, I, I think that would be the, the one of those things that would be there, but it wouldn't be there when you're when you're looking at that racetrack. Right on. Right on. Tim, thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you for, for stopping by on a regular Tuesday night and joining the chat. You're such an important part of the Canadian racing fabric. I, I don't think you realize what a what a key figure you are, but it's awesome to know you and have you down there and be able to shoot the shit about things that come up racing. I always enjoy it. 
Well, and that's just it. We're out here having fun. We're chasing race cars. I think I've got 47 on my schedule for this year, not counting everything before and after the season. So, yeah, looking forward to the year, looking forward to getting it kicked off. we got a couple of car shows and everything else before we get going, and uh, I think I'm heading back down to the NX event in Nashville before we uh, get the season kicked off. But always look forward to, to hanging out on a Tuesday night and catching you guys. And uh, when we're busy, I usually uh, do the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series on the production side. Obviously, I'm on vacation. We're not doing it now. But uh, if I don't catch it, I usually catch it on replay on Wednesday. So uh, always, uh, always love watching the show. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Say hi to Tony for us. Two great guests already, Adam. Uh, Matt Williamson will be joining us soon. But uh, we've heard some great stuff. You know, I think uh, Derek and both Tim have a lot of experience in this industry. And uh, what I'm taking from it is we're still on the we're still on the positive side of things, which is great. I Clint, I say it all the time. We are very fortunate uh, in Canada in general. I know Canada is huge, but in the Maritimes and on, there are some really good racing programs going on. Did you notice one thing about Tim Terry? He doesn't pause. You ask him a question, and it is right there. It is at the front of his mind. And we we went to PEI, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia. We went everywhere, and there wasn't even an a, ounce of hesitation to talk about what classes run at what tracks what's the big event when he's going to be there who likes it from like that man has knowledge i'm wondering has he got a private helicopter or his arms must be tired fly like that's a lot of travel <clears throat> between those tracks just to follow what they call their area <laughs> it's like yeah yeah gross. no he he puts in the time he puts in the the, the miles behind the wheel well uh, let's talk about Delaware. They made a management change. Uh, this came out this week, Adam. Uh, Delaware Speedway uh, making some changes as the 2023 season is almost upon us. This week, the Speedway announced ownership changes. Or, sorry, uh, announced changes in the management department. This week, Dave Graham was announced as the new general manager. We've worked with Dave quite a bit from our association with GeForce and APC. Uh, he'll be the new general manager taking over for longtime GM Russ Erlin, who parted mutually with the Speedway ownership. Graham has been working behind the scenes in the racetrack for the day-to-day -day operations for the past couple of seasons, and Natalie Graham will assume the position of office administrator. I think from our perspective, that's great. Dave's been a great partner. It's someone awesome to work with, and I think it's going to make our G-Force visits to Delaware even better because Russ was awesome too at the end to work with. So, um, no, it was great. I'm excited about it. Thoughts? Yeah, from what, I, from what I've seen, um, I like the way Dave communicates. Just just no nonsense. Here's what's going on. Very good at keeping the, the lines of communication open. I was surprised, Clint. I thought initially when Luke Ramsey and his team came and took over, I, I thought that would be the end of Russ. Like I thought, okay, this will be a transition. The new leadership will come in. But they seem to work well together. And, and, and Russ was actually, Russ is very high strung. Like when, when it's race season, when stuff's going on, Russ is 150 miles an hour. And I actually thought he was calming down. Like, like he was really getting into his groove there. I thought last. Yeah, I would say he was happier, more relaxed. Did we lose Adam's audio there? We lost your audio there, Adam. I'm not sure what that's up with, but uh, you can check that out. While you do that, we're going to jump into our Burger Barn video of the week. Today, it's Kyle Busch's interview after his race win. Let's take a look at that. Coulda, shoulda, woulda, right? Last week, but um, no, I, I think it's just phenomenal. It's, um, I can't thank Richard and Judy enough. I can't thank Austin for calling me and, uh, and getting me talking and getting me this opportunity to be able to come over here to RCR and be a part of Chevrolet and um, you know, be able to race this Lucas Oil uh, Camaro today to be able to put it up front like that, man. The guys did a great job, Randall, uh, everybody that uh, has worked so hard during the offseason, we've done a lot of sim stuff. We've done a lot of testing uh, in general just with, um, you know, trying to get up to speed systems and all that sort of stuff. But, man, there's nothing more rewarding than being able to go to Victory Lane. So I uh, want to give a shout-out to uh, my wife and son and daughter back at home. I miss you guys. I'll see you tonight. And then, um, you know, also Rowdy Energy, appreciate them. I need some three chief for my hands, man. I death gripped that wheel throughout the uh, the second half of that race, but um, we held on, man. We got it today. Kyle, you've won a lot of big races through your career, but given everything so that went in with the move and the change in teams, where I, does this one rank? 
it's very easy to be gracious in victory. But people love a comeback story. And Kyle Busch was down and out last year. Right, Kyle? And we've had the conversation. You can win lots of races. You can be good everywhere. But if you're a jerk, nobody wants you. So in the Joe Gibbs organization, right, Joe Gibbs is held in high regard. As, you know, you toe the line when you're under Joe Gibbs. He, he, he makes you a better person, so on and so forth. Well, it wasn't happening with Kyle Busch. And turns out Joe Gibbs is paying Kyle Busch out of his own money because I guess the sponsors aren't getting behind it. But people don't remember how universally disliked Dale Earnhardt was. <laughs> Dale You're Earnhardt not was not a well-liked driver until the last few years. There was more booze than there was cheers. But that relationship with Richard Childress, where Childress says, you know, hey, you're, you're Dale Earnhardt, be you, do your thing. He embraces that bad boy. So it's a good fit for Kyle Busch. But people love that. People love a comeback story. Like if the black hat, if Kyle Busch is going to be the black hat driver, wear the black hat, go to the right team. He's with the right team. He didn't apologize for who he was, but he found a place where he was accepted. And I think people can accept that a lot better than they could. Kyle Busch is still going to be a dick. I'm just going to finish it off with that. He's still going to be a jerk when things don't go his way. But I'm so glad he came out here and won right off the bat. Get it out of the way. Now go back to being Kyle Busch. And we are going to see more and more people like Kyle Busch because he's in a more comfortable place. But keep in mind, this is nothing new. Let's bring our next guest, Matt Williamson, fresh off the Gator win down at Volusia past week. Matt, welcome to the program. How's it? How you doing, man? Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm good. I'm uh, just relaxing this week. We got uh, a few more days off until we kick off and, and race pretty much every week. Uh, Matt, you broke some hearts in Volusia. Last lap passes. I mean, you, you, you're just, it's like taking candy from kids. Like they earned those wins and you, you just killed it. How uh, how good did that feel, though, to get up on the wheel and chase down a win where it really didn't look like you were going to? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was certainly exciting. Um, happy that uh, happy that we won. Um, you know, the fans had something to cheer for. You know, with with good racing, whether or not I won or lost, I mean, it was good racing, and uh, that's all you can ask for. I mean, there was there was three races down there. I know three of them were really good, so. Um, you know, got to got to say thanks to all my guys that made it happen to go down there and race. But uh, yeah, it was cool to come home with two wins. Now we're just talking about guys like Dale Earnhardt, and uh, you know, getting booed for winning so much. And Kyle Busch, uh, are you still on the cheers, or are you getting to the boo side yet, Matt? Uh, I think anytime you win races like we did in Florida, uh, people cheer just because the racing was exciting. You know, it's uh, that was you know the cool part about it, but. Um, we're not getting booed yet. Not not down the road, anyways. Maybe around here by a few uh, a few uh, haters, but other than that, they that they pay admission to get in the gate just like anybody else. So, uh, you know, let them let them sing. Well, that was always tradition with Pete McNeil as well. Like he got booed a lot at home, and then he'd go to Syracuse and win. And the same people that love to boo him at Merrittville are up in the grandstands, drunk out of their heads, cheering cheering their faces off. So, there's always been that. Yeah, now my exactly. question for you is to do with your multiple car team. Okay, you've been multiple years into this now. You still have a big group of guys behind you. You've got multiple cars at your disposal. How is that thing still gelling, Matt? Is it still getting tighter? Is it still working? I mean, right now it's probably better than it ever was. Um, you know, anytime you can you can win, everybody's happy and everybody's everybody's enjoying it, right? So um, right now things are going great. I mean. Um, you know, Florida is the time we get to actually hang out with Buzz a little bit, so that was cool. Um, but yeah, Jeff, Coco, uh, Paul went. Um, everybody was down there, you know, except for I wish Wayne could come to more races. I mean, he uh, he's re probably the reason why I'm at where I'm at today. And um, poor guy works every day of the week, so he never gets to come to any of these races. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's going good. Um, you know, right now we're running good, so obviously there's nothing to complain about on anybody's end. So. Um, if we can keep this keep this deal going and 
uh, keep riding this wave, then uh, certainly nobody will be uh, nobody will be upset about it. Matt, is there anything you aspire to outside of a dirt modified? Like, are there things that, that are on your bucket list? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's there's races that I'd like to do um, for more of a novelty thing. You know, not not necessarily something that I could make a living doing. Um, you know, like the the Pinty's race at Oshwigan would be cool to do. Um, obviously, I don't think I can get paid to do it. Uh, but that would be something. You know, the the big late model races at Eldora, whether it's the Million or the World or um, the Dream, any of them ones, they'd be cool to do novelty wise. Uh, but like I said, I don't think anybody's ever going to pay me to do them because I'm not proven and, and it's probably more of a risk than it is anything else. So um, right now I, I got asked this question, uh, you know, the other day in an interview and right now the, the modified stuff's paying my mortgage. So um, I just got to race that and I, I race 95 times a year, you know, so there's not really much time to, to be able to do other racing other than what we do right now. So um I got a good thing going. I don't really want to screw it up getting into something else. Matt, you know, uh, you talk about that 95 times you got multiple cars. How do you decide what car, what team you're going to bring to what track? Uh, we got a pretty easy, easy thing because everybody's got different cars, you know, like the buzz two cars are, are Hoosier tires, big blocks, uh, super dirt series cars. Um, the, the Barron's cars are more open motor, um, four thirties, three sixties and big tall door sail panels. Um, so that's a short track super series car. Uh, and then, you know, we got two small block rides, whether it's the S and W six, which is, you know, my own car with, uh, Wayne Conn's help or, um, you know, the Coco Wentz car, which we race on Fridays. We, we kind of, you know, that's more of the hard thing because they both race the same kind of things. But, um, you know, fortunately they got a different motor package than what I have. I've got a, I've got a CSR motor or a Terry Vince motor and they've got uh, the Billy, the kid motor, which the Billy, the kid motor seems to run better when the, you take the red box out or, you know, you, you're at bigger places like, um, can am. So, uh, the, the races at like Middletown at the end of the year, those are non red box races. So we'll run the Coco car. Uh, can am will run the Coco car. But when we go to Weedsport or Burton where, you know, my car runs really good till 6,500 RPM and, um, kind of peaks out there and, and it's got a low torque curve we'll run we'll run our car so um it's just uh it's just being smart about the decisions and, and hopefully you make the right ones when you when you want to how as the you know as the as the heir to the the bicknell in being in the family with the bicknell chassis matt how open is your setup book to bicknell customers I mean, there's always people pointing, I want what they've got. I want what they've got. If someone comes up to you, are you basically an open book with what you're running? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, I answer a lot of questions during the week. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily working at BRP anymore, but um, any BRP customers that want to reach out and talk to me and ask me about setups, I, 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 I answer probably, you know, five a day from different, different customers. And, um, you know, it's, it's open. Uh, you know, there's some stuff that you try to keep to yourself, but, but for the most part, everybody's on the same stuff anyways. And it's all, it's all, you know, the BRP set up book anyway. So, um, you know, we've, we've went and sold the car after we won 10 grand at Brockville, we took the motor out and sold it to Ian Boussier and, um, he went out and struggled a little bit with it. So, um, there's not really much magic with this deal anymore. I mean, you got to find a balance with what works for you. Um, and, and not chase rainbows either. You know, if you, you get chasing rainbows and you try to try to try to look at pictures and, and you know, that helps, but looking at pictures only gets you so far on, on what other cars are doing. You know, you got to see what works for you. If you don't like the car up on the right front, don't worry about getting your car up on the right front. You know, it's, it's one of the things that, you know, I drive, I drive off the right front uh, with my car more, more square than most. Um, my setup wouldn't work for Larry White. Larry White's setup probably wouldn't work for mine. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we try to help customers as much as possible. My, I get messages, like I said, on, on uh, Facebook Messenger or Instagram or Twitter or, um, you know, cell phone calls. So uh, it's pretty per – my setup looks pretty open to answer the question. Matt, uh, you know, I, in talking – I know you're helping Glenn Sires out there to try and get going in the past. And, you know, when I talk to some of the other veterans at Maryville, they say, you know, 
Not everybody can drive mat setup. You know, they're talking, you have a very tight, sweet spot. Would you agree to that? You know, like not everybody can really handle what you're, what you're putting under your car anyways. Yeah. You know, I got a, I got a short story. If, if we got time, I mean, there's a, there's a big thing right now in the 358 division about motors. Uh, everybody thinks that we've got this $35,000 motor. Nobody can afford it. Nobody can beat me because I've got this motor, you know? So um, I actually, you know, put it out there and told a few people that I'd be willing to take anybody's car, spend a week with it, but they would have to pay me what it took. Like if Maribel pays 1800 to win that Saturday, I would want 1800 bucks guaranteed. But if I don't win, I'll, I'll go back on that. So um, it's, it's one of the things like, you know, no, nothing can replace hard work. Um, you know, it, the motor deal is kind of probably going to be the end of the 358 division, the way that it's going. Um, it seems like the tracks, you know, want to have more control on, on motors than they should. And, um, nobody really wants to listen anyway. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of funny, but, um, uh, we're at a unique time for modified racing again. I, I think you make a good point there, Matt. It, it, it's a challenging time for sure. People have good intentions, but, but nobody looks at shouldn't say nobody not many people look at the big picture and the big picture is pennsylvania new york ontario quebec being able to buy and sell in that big a market and move stuff around there are not many racetrack promoters that, that care enough about that big picture to work together still better than the asphalt racing scene but uh but you're right it's a challenging spot right now what but what what's the answer matt yeah, I don't know. I mean, at this point, we're kind of putting ourselves on an island. You know, so is Quebec. I mean, they're they're going to American racers, and, and we'll see how it works out up there. But um, I don't know. I, I I wish that there would be an engine builder around here that would come up with a solution that we could support local and and um, you know whether it's a whether it's a seven hundred horsepower, fifteen thousand dollar motor. You know, right now everybody's fighting over over five or fifteen horsepower. You know, everybody's going out and spending huge money to get five to 15 horsepower because that's the difference right now. Um, I feel like what we have is on the edge of being too much for Maritville Speedway, Humberstone Speedway, maybe not Oshwegan um, when it's faster, but certainly when it slows down, the racing can be good. So you don't need all that horsepower anyway. So if there was an engine builder that came out with a motor that was say 700 horsepower and $15,000 and it was open, like the, the cylinder heads, you could, you could port them out, you could do whatever you wanted but you're never going to improve that motor. I think that would be probably the better solution than what we're going through right now. Um, we've almost got too many spec motors, too many crate motors per se. Uh, I wish that they'd almost open up the rules and just let us have at it. But um, in the meantime, we'll just keep doing what we're doing and showing up and arguing about it and complaining about it. And you know, it'll be year to year and we'll just, we'll be the, the end of our own deal. You're winning. So it can't be too bad, Maddie. Let's uh, talk about where you're going to race next. Uh, yeah, I got, uh, this coming weekend off and then next weekend we race Hagerstown in Maryland. Um, after Hagerstown, we race, uh, Sealands Grove in Pennsylvania and then Bridgeport and then Atomic in Ohio. So, um, basically from next weekend on, we race every weekend until after Charlotte in the middle of November. No doubt. Wow. Thanks for being here. Wow. Thanks for stopping in, Matt. Great job in Florida. Exciting finishes. Uh, like you said, they were three great races down there at Volusia, so can't ask for much more, but thanks for spending time with us. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Take care, man. Good luck. Well, three awesome guests. Adam, uh, we got a few more things to chime through before we end. we got about six minutes left to go here, maybe five-ish. Um, how about the APC new website? This is something that came out this week. I thought it was awesome. They have a database of every driver, so if you get a chance, make sure you check that out at the new APC website. It is uh, pretty freaking cool what they've got going on there. The fact that you can get all the stats from just about any racer at, the, at your fingertips is amazing. Uh, make sure you check it out. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's going to help that, us out a lot. I looked at that list, and I'm going, like, is this every driver that's ever driven a race car? And then I looked and said, no, these are, these are active drivers or drivers that, that have been in the last little bit like they're all relevant yeah so the website is apcracing.com make sure you go check that out and uh 
it'll have all the information you could want right there. It's the driver archive. So go to apcracingseries.com, check out the driver archive. It is super cool. Uh, alphabetical order and every stat from any driver they've ever had in the series, which is so cool. I think we are going to put that to so much use this summer with our live broadcast having that at our fingertips. It's going to oh, be amazing. Oh, no. When you say we, you mean you who's down on the infield? Oh, come on. You guys is live the, on your computers. Is that computers. the we you're talking about? You guys live on your computers up there. All I hear is you and Greg bitch about how your laptops aren't working or, or unplugging each other's laptops. I'm sitting down there with a can of Pepsi and my kid. That's all I got oh, to yeah, work don't, with. Don't take credit for my hard work on a laptop. Oh, okay. You're, you're, not, you're going to have your Pepsi in one hand and, and your kid by the neck in the other hand. So he doesn't get killed. Uh, let's run through a couple other things. Friday Night Thunder Awards. Congratulations to Friday Night Thunder crew, Derek Miller, Laura Milliken, and everybody. They've been nominated for uh, some screen awards, which is amazing, uh, for the soundtrack to Friday Night Thunder, which is super cool. Derek, uh, our crate racer in the sprint division, uh, does it all himself in his home studio, records it all. It's super cool. They've been nominated. <coughs> Sorry. This is our latest Friday Night Show, uh, Friday Night Thunder Season 2. Received one Canadian Screen Award uh, nomination. And it's for best original music for our composer Derek Miller. So that's super cool. Make sure you check that show out on APTN. Uh, still airing weekly and giving you some great looks inside our Week and Speedway. Uh, ice racing on Lake Hennessy. Next week we're going to try and get Andrew Hennessy on to talk about why he would go out and have ice racing in his backyard. But uh, I thought it was cool. And we'll talk a bit about that. Adam, anything I, you want to say about that? I don't want to know why he did it. I want to know why he didn't invite GeForce TV down to take part. You'd either have like a, a F list celebrity race where you and I could go out there and play on the ice or get us down there to shoot the action. But what a cool looking uh, racetrack. Yeah. Uh, how about some circular hockey? Let's let's play hockey in a circle around that. I'm in for that too. But uh, no, good job uh, execution there with uh, Andrew Hennessy and his family. Cool little deal they got going on there. We'll get him on to talk about that coming up. Uh, what else we got to talk about? Our Shweekin Rules meetings, things went very, very well yesterday. Uh, great turnout of the GSR shop. Super proud of everybody working together. We just have a great crew. Um, and what I mean by that is the race teams. You know, we're talking about some sensitive and some explosive topics that everybody wants to fight over. And instead of fighting, the guys that were most affected by it stood up and said, hey, I don't think you should give us that advantage. It wouldn't be right. We want to keep things the way they are. And that just kind of brought everybody together. Matt Hill shows up with smoked brisket, fed everybody in the place, just out of his goodwill, which is amazing. Uh, Matt's just cool like that. So we appreciate He's that. He's prepaying. He's prepaying <laughs> all the favors he asked for all season long. Well, I did see the first one he fed was Doug Leonard. So he's, he's trying to butter up some uh, get-out-of-jail-free cards in the bank so he can stick it on a Monopoly table for later on in the game. But let's um, talk about the biggest story that came out of there. This is what the fans are going to notice anyways. Double file uh, all the way to five to go in the 360s. Five more laps been added. It'll be 25 lap features. Double file till 20 to go. Along with the choose rule, similar to NASCAR, has been instituted. So that's going to be amazing that uh, there's going to be a lot more strategy on these restarts now with the 360s. And the other big thing, Adam, is we've eliminated uh, two minutes in the work area except for tires and wings so if you have a, a mash wing or a flat tire you'll get your two minutes other than that nothing is guaranteed and uh you only have guaranteed work time till fifth to lap 15 in both the crates and the 360s so that hopefully will speed up the show in a couple aspects and let's face it, i don't know how many times i roll up to a scene see a car that's mango the driver strapped in says i want my work here because they know something's wrong and we know they're not going to fix it but we have to give it to them the crew tries their best for two minutes and then not even close and we end up wasting all that time anyway so it's exciting. I think it's going to be cool. What are your thoughts on those new rules? I, I like that you went with the choose rule to go with the double file restarts. Takes a little bit of the pressure off some of the drivers who might not be comfortable with that double file restart for throughout most of the race. But at least you can say, look, if you're comfortable on the outside, restart on the outside. You, you've got some options there. So, no, I think it'll be good. It's good for entertainment. And for too long... Drivers have been too reliant and too boastful about the redraw system or the luck of the draw system. You know, yeah. it, I think this takes it all away right off the bat. First caution, 
redraws don't matter anymore. And the other thing yeah. is, you know, if you're a top, if you like it on the top, you can go to the top. I'm excited because I think you're going to see some of the veterans really use this in, in a great way. And I think we're going to see some great gamesmanship go on here. And I think, you know, if the first four drivers take the top and a driver in fifth can now slide down inside pole on a night when the bottom isn't where it's at, but they're going to take that gamble. I love it. I, I think as broadcasters, it's going to be as exciting as heck. Sure. So show fun. me Lucas Smith or Mac demand, like setting up, setting up their bonsai moves, but no, I, I do think it's great. I, yeah. I think it'll be a lot of fun to watch. Uh, last thing we've got is, Call them out Facebook page. I want to talk about this at length next week, Adam. Uh, this is something that was brought up uh, into our attention. This is a Facebook page that someone has created and it's getting spread around where you're calling out the biggest cheater at your racetrack and saying, hey, this guy's been getting away with this for too long. Uh, some wild comments, some wild grammar, and some wild everything you could ever want to read with your morning coffee, right? Exactly. And, you know, I think if you take it in good fun, it's good fun. But based on the comments, a lot of people are not taking it in good fun. And uh, it can get out of hand in a hurry. But, yeah, let's give it some time it deserves next week. Right on. So thanks, everybody, for joining us here tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks to all our guests, uh, Tim Terry, Derek Lynch, and Matt Williamson. If there's anybody you want to see in this program, let us know. We'll do our best to get them on. And uh, it's been awesome. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Good show. We'll see you next week.